How are we doing? If you don't know who I am, my name is Kalai. I'm one of the pastors here. Haven't been here with you folks in a, a few weeks, but I'm excited to bring the message. And so if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, that's where we're going to be in. We're in this series called Ohana Matters, and really the most important relationships in our lives are our family. And that's why we want to make sure that we're living in a way that reflects that. And so Genesis chapter 4, give you kind of a backstory to uh, the characters that we're going to be uh, looking at today, uh, this story in the Bible is kind of like the, um, an old school CSI scene. How many of us like CSI? This would be like CSI East of Eden. That's kind of where we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, this story encaptures en uh, a lot of firsts in the Bible. It's the first pregnancy. It's the first birth. It's the first family, the first crime, and the first death. And also in this story, we'll see the first offering to God. And this communicates to all of us that there's an expectation when we interact with God that we should be bringing something to God, that we don't go to God empty-handed. And so Genesis chapter 4, 1 to 12, it'll be up on screen. You can follow along. It goes and says this, Adam, excuse me, Adam made love to his wife Eve. Come on now, Adam. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and its desires, it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field, he said. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, which means we can never, ever hide anything from God because he sees everything. Now you are under a curse driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. The title of my message tonight is this, Becoming Cain when you're not able. Think about it. Becoming Cain when you're not able. If you're ready for the word, say yeah. yeah. If you want God to speak to your heart, say oh yeah. oh yeah. Come on, let's give God some praise as we break open his word. Come on. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this word. Let it be from your spirit that speaks to our heart here tonight. Lord, we want a relevant rhema word to be revealed to us tonight that would change us from the inside out. So, Lord, give us uh, eyes to see, our ears to hear, and a heart that is open to receive everything that you want to deposit into our lives today. We want to leave better than we came, and only you can do that. So we thank you for your word. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. By a show of hands, how many of us have siblings in the house? Any people with siblings? I did some research on siblings. I am the youngest of five siblings. <clears throat> and there's some scientific facts about siblings that I want to share with you tonight. Here's the first fact about siblings. We'll spend more time with our siblings than any other person in our lives. Scientifically speaking, more than our parents because our siblings will typically outlast our parents. But on the scope of all of our lives, the most of the time that we'll be spending in relationships, even more than our spouse, is with our siblings. Here's the second fact. 
having siblings of the opposite sex makes you better at dating and marriage. Because you get an understanding and an idea on how to interact with the opposite sex in the context of family. Here's another fact. Older siblings are typically more smarter than younger siblings, just generally. But here's the funny part. Younger siblings are funnier than the older siblings. Come on. We got jokes, y'all. We got some jokes. Here's another fact about siblings. Parents do have a favorite sibling. No matter what they tell you, I love you all the same. Every parent has a favorite sibling. And if you are the favorite sibling, say amen. amen. Lots of favorites in the house. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Here's the last fact. Here's the last fact. Studies show that half of siblings have uh, experienced some level of rivalry with their other sibling while they were growing up. How many of us would say that you've experienced some level of rivalry with your other sibling? Now, I say all of this to encourage us in some aspect, but to let us know that, really, our family is important. Uh, and that's why we're in this series, Family Matters, because, or Hana Matters, because families are important. And here's one of the reasons why family is important to you and I, because it shapes us in a way that helps us to know how to have healthy relationships in our lives. We learn intrinsically how to have relationships by building with the people in our lives, our, our siblings growing up. And so here's the other truth about that. If we've experienced dysfunction in the house, it'll lead to dysfunctions in our relationships. And many of us today are experiencing dysfunctions in our current relationships because we learned that growing up. We were experiencing some level of dysfunction within our households, and so we carry that dysfunction into all of our current relationships today. And so that's why this series is so important, but that's why I feel like this message is so important, because we're going to learn from the first family and the first siblings on how we can deal with some of the dysfunctions in all of our lives. And so from that story that we just read, I'm going to pull out four truths, and I'm going to leave us with two takeaways as we wrap up tonight. So the first truth is this, the condition of our heart matters to God. Our heart condition is very important to the God that we serve. To set this up, I want to give you some background. So Cain, he's the oldest, and his name means to get or to acquire. He was a farmer just like his father, Adam. Now Abel, he was the youngest, and his name means a vapor or breath. And that's interesting because from this story, we see that that's how quick his life was, just like a vapor or breath. But his occupation, he was a shepherd. Now, the interesting thing about this, these brothers is that they were blood brothers, but they were separate in spirit. So although they had the same blood, their spirits were the exact opposites. Here's the truth. They both knew God, but one was righteous and the other was unrighteous. And that's the crazy thing is that we can have a relationship or be around proximity with God and two siblings can turn out quite differently. And so we're going to look at how we can turn our, our hearts in such a way that we can be the righteous able rather than allowing our hearts to stray where we become like Cain. But what we see is that what was happening in their heart was revealed in what they gave to God. So verse 3 to 5 says this, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Here's the truth for all of us. Worship is important to God, and we got to worship God on his expectations of worship, not on what we feel like we should worship. So we got to meet God and worship him in the way that he expects. So there's two reasons that I want to share with us tonight on why one offering was accepted and not the other. And the first reason is this. It's the condition of the offering. The condition of the offering. So it's not because that God loves meat and hates vegetables. That's why he accepted Abel's. You know, God's not, you know, he doesn't hate vegans. That's not why he 
didn't like Cain's offering because in other parts of Scripture, vegetables was a viable offering that we can give to God. But here's the interesting part from this passage that we see is that Cain brought some of the fruits and Abel, he brought two things that was interesting. He bought the first of the flock and he also bought the best part of the flock, the fat portions. Now what that means for us is this, that when it comes to an animal sacrifice, it's the fattest one that's the best. And that's why I would never want to get abs because I want to give God the best part of my body. The fat portions. Come on, somebody say amen. We want to give God our best. He wants my fat. Take it, Lord. This is all for you. So that's what's the interesting part. Abel gave to God the first of his flock, but also the best of his flock. While Cain only gave some of the fruit. Now for you and I, we have to understand this, that it takes faith to give God first. It doesn't take faith to give God what you want to give. It takes faith to give God first. What I mean by that is before your bills, before all these other things that you want to do with your finances, it takes faith to give God on the top first. It doesn't, give, it doesn't take faith for us to give him what's left, but it does take faith to give God first. I want to explain it like this. Uh, how many of us have ever gone to a vending machine before? vending machine, you maybe want to get some Cheez-Its from the vending machine. And how many of us know that there's a particular way that the vending machine accepts bills? There's a certain type of bill that the vending machine needs to take. It can't take a $100 bill. If you put a $100 bill into the machine, it won't take it. But it usually takes dollars and fives. That's the most that it will take. And it also needs to take a, a specific condition of bill. How many of us have ever tried to give the vending machine a crumpy bill and realize what happens? It only gets spit right back out, right? So you need to have a type of bill. You need to have a, a, a quality condition bill. But here's the other thing. You also have to put the bill in the right way. Because you might have a crispy bill, but if you put it in backwards, what's going to happen? It's going to kick you right back out. And so when we're giving the dollar to the bit on the machine... When it's kicking it back out, we start to think, okay, maybe it's the bill, maybe it's the condition. You ever did that? You rub the bill on the side of the machine to straighten it out, put it back in, right? None of us get mad at the machine when it kicks it back out. Like, what's wrong with the machine? Well, maybe if you have anger issues, you do that. But usually you start to think, it's what I'm putting in that's the issue. Not the machine. It's the way that I'm giving the bill that might need to be tweaked. Cain was blaming God about his offering. He had a moment where he could just analyze, analyze himself and be like, maybe it's something about me that's the problem. Maybe I need to change something about my heart. Maybe I need to change something about my offering. Maybe it's less about God and more about me. And so it was the condition of his offering that was the problem. He didn't God, give God his first. And he also didn't give God his best. And that's one of the reasons why God didn't accept that offering. The second thing is this. It's the character of the offerer. So the first thing is the condition of the offering. The second thing is the character of the offerer. Here's the truth for you and I need to understand. God does not see worship apart from the worshiper. The way we worship God and who we are are connected. So there was something weird about Cain's heart that wasn't right with God. And that was seen, his heart posture was seen in the gift that he gave to God. And Hebrews 11.4 gives us insight to the condition of Cain's heart when he gave it to God. It says this, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. Abel gave the first and gave his best, but he also gave it with a heart of faith. And faith pleases God. And so Cain 
lacked faith in how he gave it to God. His heart wasn't right because our heart and our gift are connected. It's kind of like this. Ladies, if you like a guy and you're having conversations with this guy, and the topic of flowers comes up, okay? And in the topic of uh, flowers in that conversation, you like him, he kind of likes you, and so you're kind of giving him insight Onto, into flowers. And so you're having a conversation and you tell this person that, you know, my favorite flower is lilies. But also, my least favorite flower is roses. Now, not only do you hate roses, you're also deathly allergic to roses. And the, the closer you get to a rose, the, it just flares up all kinds of allergic reactions to it. So you tell them this. Now your birthday comes around, and you're at work, and the office calls you and says that you have a gift. And so you're excited because you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get me some flowers. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so you go to the front to get the flowers, and what do you see? You see a jar of roses. And you're going to be like, what the heck is wrong with this dude? Why? Because you specifically told him that your favorite flower is what? Lilies. And that you're deathly allergic to roses. Now, anyone in their right mind would not do the exact opposite of what you tell them to do, right? You're thinking to yourself, this guy is something is wrong with him. A couple screws is loose in his head. And usually, if you're smart, kick that guy to the curb. Why? Because you specifically told him what you liked and don't like. And the fact that he, told, he, he went and did what you don't want reveals that there's something wrong, not only with his head, but also with his heart. God clearly tells us that what it takes to please him, it's faith. Faith is seen all throughout scripture. The Bible says that it takes faith to please God. And God is the only person that we can't fool with our actions because he sees our heart. So it's not just doing the right thing. It's also doing it with the right heart. And there was something wrong about Cain's heart that was revealed in his offering. And that's why God didn't accept his offering. He's drawn to faith, but he's actually reposed by pride and any other attitude that we have in our heart. So we must approach God with an attitude of faith. Second point in our notes is this. Control your emotions or they will control you. Verse 6 and 7 says this. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face downcast? Now, anytime God asks us a question, it's not because he wants to know the answer. He already knows the answer. He's trying to get us to figure out something by asking us these questions. So if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So God sees something wrong with Cain. And the thing I love about God, he still draws closer to Cain. He has a conversation with him. And God was giving Cain an opportunity to change. So here's what God was implying. He was saying this, all you have to do is what is right. I'm not favoring Abel over you. There's equal acceptance for all. But the condition of the acceptance is this, got to do what is right. If you do what is right, no problem, fully accepted. But if you don't do what is right, Not only do we have an issue, but there's a real enemy that wants to pounce on your life, and he's waiting for an opportunity. So here's what we see from this story is this. Abel was focused on God. Cain was focused on Abel. Abel was just worried about doing the right thing for God. Cain was side-eyeing Abel. Be like, bruh, you think you're better than me? Come on, somebody. Oh, you think you're the better brother. I'm the older one. Well, you think you're the favorite. And that's where jealousy and envy starts creeping in because Cain took his focus off of God and started to put his focus on other people. And that's where most problems happen in life. Let me tell you this. Once we take our eyes off of God, we get into issues. And then we put our eyes on other people, and then we start comparing and contrasting our lives with them, and that leads us into a lot of other issues. It happens in marriage. Husbands be working, working 60 to 80 hours a week, 
And all you do is stay home and watch the kids. Well, you, you know, you don't even have dinner on the table when I come home. Right? Focusing on the other person. Happens at work. Oh, why did that person get promoted? Shoots, I do way more work than them. Shoots, why they got promoted and why not me? It happens all the time on social media. Like, what, another vacation? That's like the third one this year. <laughs> Must be nice. Must be nice. Here's the funny thing. It even happens in church. What, another person in relationship? Jeez. I don't even have a friend of the opposite sex. Come on, somebody. God bless you. So happy for you, heart emojis. Here's the thing that, here's the problem. Comparison not only kills our joy, but it also hinders our connection with other people. You can't be connected closely to someone that you're jealous of. There's always going to be a level of fakeness that someone's going to sense, and there's never going to be true connection. So when we start comparing ourselves, it'll kill our joy, but it'll also kill our relationships with other people. And we start to pull away from God and pull away from other people. And this is where the enemy pounces because the, the sin that is talked about here is basically mismanage emotions. When we don't manage our emotions right, there's a real enemy that wants to capitalize at our weak points. So Cain was mad at God, but he was also mad at Abel. And here's the thing. A lot of people are mad with God, but they're just in denial. Because it feels weird to verbally say, God, I'm mad at you about my current situation. Here's the thing I love about God. All of the Psalms reveal that we can be honest with him, that he's not afraid of our emotions. In fact, he invites us to process our emotions with him. He was inviting Cain to process his emotions, but Cain did the most disrespectful thing that we could do, with not only to God, but a person, gave him the silent treatment. Nowhere in this story do we ever see Cain responding to God. So God was inviting him to process. That's why we do life in small groups here. But his resistance to processing his emotions led to a greater sin in his life. So we all have feelings, but we don't have to be ruled by our feelings. Let me just say it this way. Feelings are something that we have, but it's not something that we are. You don't have to be identified by your feelings. You don't have to be led by your feelings. So the Bible is telling us here that you have feelings, but you also can rule over your feelings. You can lead your life in spite of how you feel. Ephesians 4 says this, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives, the foot, uh, gives a foothold to the, to the devil. So anger isn't a sin. We can be angry and not sin. But what we do with our anger can lead to sin. So this verse is basically saying this. Don't let your emotions fester. When you neglect them, it only gets worse. Because emotions are not neutral. They will grow. So it will grow. Anger and jealousy will grow and lead to something big like murder. You might be thinking to yourself, I will never murder someone, but if you don't deal with your anger, you eventually will. You might not physically murder them, but you will murder some important relationships in your life by not dealing with that emotion. So in regards to our anger, the Bible is telling us this, get on it early because it costs too much to wait. Delaying on dealing with your anger will cause devastation to our relationships. So here's what I give all of you this picture. In all of our hearts, we have these two characters. We have an Abel that wants to do right to God and with God, but we all have an inner Cain as well. And they're both at war for our attention and for our decisions. So here's the truth. If we don't kill our inner Cain, our inner Cains will kill some of the important Abel relationships in our lives. So let me say it this way. You're either going to kill Cain or Cain's going to kill you. So we got to do some inner work. And one of the ways that we can deal with our emotions is processing with the right people. You got to have people that will give you what God wants you to hear in your life. The devil can't make us sin, but he can entice us to sin. 
And you and I have to make the decision not to give in to that bait, to resist it, and to trust God with our hearts and with our relationships. Third point in our notes is this. Hurting them doesn't heal you. Let me say it louder for the people in the back and online. Hurting them does not heal you. Verse 8 says this, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While, were there, while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Seven times in this verses of Scripture, we see brother Abel, brother Abel. And Cain killed his brother Abel. It's not exactly clear on how he killed Abel, but here's what's clear. We know that he felt good when he did it. And revenge always feels good in the moment, right? We get a glimpse of fulfillment, excitement by doing the revenge that we feel like is going to give us what we really want. But here's the truth about revenge. Retaliation doesn't bring the healing that your heart desires. It's a trap. You feel like, man, if I just get back at them, then I'm going to feel better with myself. But when you hurt them, it only ends up hurting you even more. But we feel like if I just do this, I'm going to get some level of uh, relief, but we never get it. It's kind of like football. It's usually the second person that retaliates that gets the flag. The first person never gets the flag. It's usually the person who reacts retaliates and responds that gets the penalty. Same thing goes for our relationships. It's usually the person that retaliates that gets themselves into a lot of problems and issues. So don't give in to the lie of the enemy that makes you think that if you retaliate, you're going to feel better. It's not going to give you the healing that your heart leads, desperately needs. We need to trust God with our emotions, but we need to trust God with the other person as well. So somebody needs to hear this. Hurting them won't heal you. It's only going to make you worse. Then you're going to have to deal with more issues in your heart. Last point is this. God is merciful, but sin has consequences. We love God's mercy. We don't like the consequences for our actions. And Cain needed to experience some consequences. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now, did Cain know where his brother was? Yeah, because he killed him. But Cain gave some sass back to God, says, am I bro my brother's keeper? He's not my responsibility. You, you go find him. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse. This is the first curse in Bible and scripture that was upon man. You are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. Now, what was he? He was a farmer, which meant that whatever he did to try and farm, he's not going to get fruit. Imagine that. The career that you spent your life doing is not going to produce the fruit that you want anymore. That was part of his consequence. And here's the second thing. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. His main consequence was separation. Sin, at its essence, will always lead to separation from God, but also separation from people. Cain was separated from God, but ultimately he was separated from his family. Part of his consequence was that he needed to be separated from his family. And when we sin against people, specifically within our family, there is that sin causes a separation. And sometimes we want to apologize and get back and, you know, try to make amends. But sometimes the person just needs space because they need time to heal. And we can't get mad at them because of the separation that our actions caused in the relationship. we got to trust God that in his time he's going to bring the restoration and the reconciliation that we desire. But God was even merciful to Cain in his rebellion. He put a mark on Cain and said that if anyone tries to mess with Cain, they're going to experience seven times more problems in their lives. So even in Cain's rebellion, he still experienced mercy. But that mercy 
did not alleviate him from experiencing the consequences, consequences, which is separation. And sin will always cause separation in our lives. Now, here's two key takeaways that I want to leave us with tonight from this story that I hope would encourage all of our hearts. Here's the first takeaway is this. Parents need to be fully present in the lives of their kids. Where are the parents at in the house? Raise your hand. I want to preach to us tonight because I'm a parent. We need to be fully present in their lives. Never in this story do we hear a mention of Adam and Eve. They're non-existent in this story. Maybe they were busy working. Maybe Adam was out there doing what God says he needed to, to work. But their lack of presence left a void in the life of their kids. And here's the truth for you and I as parents. Sometimes we're so busy that it's impossible for us to be present. And even when we're physically present, we're emotionally vacant. Because our minds are thinking about a ton of different things, right? Can we be honest? And when we're in this moment, what we just want is peace and quiet. We don't want any issues, right? And so what do we do? We give the parenting duties to the iPad and to the TV. Go watch iPad. Go watch the TV. Why? Because we don't want to deal with that because we got other things to deal with. Let me tell you this. A neglect of that will lead to further problems down the road. We can't leave a void to one of our main responsibilities, which is to parent our kids. And some of the reasons why our kids are acting out is because they desperately want our attention. And the only time that they can get our attention is what? When we act out. So what are they going to do? Act out more to what? Get our attention. So sometimes we want to deal with the acting out. Give them your presence. Let your present be your presence. Come on, somebody. I want to share with you, there's four stages of parenting that we all need to understand. And even if you don't have kids, this is something good for you to know. There's four stages. It's the discipline years, which is about from ages uh, birth to about five years old. The need in this phase of life is consistency. The kids need consistency. The next phase is the training years, ages five to 12. The key things that children need in this age of their life is understanding. They need to understand. They need to know why the world is a certain way, why we do a certain things. That's why the main question during that phase is why, why, why? They're desperately wanting understanding. Then ages 12 to 18 is the coaching years. And what they need from us is guidance. We need to guide them, but also give them experience. And then the adult ages is the friendship years. And what they need from us is space. Here's the problem I see with most parents because I was a youth minister for a season of my life is this. We want to be a friend with them in the coaching age. We want to be friends with them in the age where they need our coaching, but we can't be their friends. We need to be their parents first. And so we need to make sure that we're operating in the way that season requires of us to parent them. Your kids shouldn't be your best friend until they're adults. And if we mismanage these years, Sometimes the lack of relationship that we have later on in life is because we mismanage the early seasons that God calls us to manage. So if we want to parent, we need to parent these phases well. Here's the second takeaway for all of us is this. Doing right doesn't remove bad things from happening. And that sounds weird in church because we always preach obedience. But obedience doesn't mean that everything goes well in your life. Let me say it this way. Abel didn't do anything wrong, and he got murdered for it. So for you and I, sometimes we think and equate that if I only do right, that means right things are going to happen. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes the consequences of doing wrong is more bad things happening in our life. But we don't control the outcome. We just control our obedience. God controls the outcome. And sometimes us doing the right thing leads to wrong responses in our lives. And we can't blame God for that. Jesus did everything right, and he still went to the cross. Jesus did everything right, and he still experienced betrayal. He didn't do anything wrong, yet he experienced what you and I would experience on a daily basis. And so doing right doesn't mean that right things are the outcome, but doing right pleases God. 
And later on in Hebrews, we see that because of Cain or Abel doing right, his life still preaches a message. And sometimes our actions do the best preaching when we walk in obedience to God. Our lives will preach a message to other people. Sometimes right now you feel like I want to retaliate and get them back. Sometimes you doing the right thing in obedience to God will preach a message to them. Sometimes you feeling that you should retaliate and they're expecting retaliation and you love them back. They'll be like, what the heck is wrong with this person? Why? Because doing right will preach a message. So I know revenge feels right, but doing right will preach a better message. And that's where we trust God. We can't manipulate God by doing right. He controls the outcome, but we can't give him glory when we do. Jesus brought God the most glory by being obedient to the cross. And our lives can do the same thing when we trust God completely with our life and with our obedience. Let's pray tonight. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this word. We pray that you do a deep work in all of our hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that you would, even now, as you've been speaking throughout this service, throughout this message, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see you in a new way. Take off the blinders that's prevented us from seeing you for who you really are. Sometimes our emotions can cloud our view of you. And tonight, Holy Spirit, we're praying that your spirit will blow away the haze so that we can see the beauty and the wonder of who you are. We're living for you, the audience of one. And we're trusting you with our hearts, with our lives, and with our relationships. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen.